when you're over here, when you're over there. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we bless you and praise you tonight. 
and we honor you for who you are we pray that your words tonight will go forth with clarity with power we ask you for a peculiar anointing in a peculiar environment this is a peculiar convention we need more from you tonight i pray that god your words will be like fresh water and souls will be refreshed revived strengthened tonight from the very heart of queens new york as far as Trinidad, Tobago, and the United Kingdom, in Belize, and uh, California, and throughout the cut parishes of Jamaica, Florida, wherever we are tonight in Canada, Lord, I pray that the flow, the flow, the flow, hallelujah, the flow of God will touch your people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I honor the Lord in a special way tonight for our dear General Overseer, Bishop Donald Maxwell, and to First Lady Maxwell. And I thank God for all of our bishops presiding in the various regions. We thank God for each and every one of you. We are asking God this weekend to just move as he desires and as he sees fit to every minister, every worker, every leader in every church, and every member, every friend of this great organization. We thank God for you tonight. We cannot tell you how much we appreciate you in words. There's not enough words to say thanks. But as we stand in this place for 82 years, many have come and God has transitioned them from here to glory. Tonight we stand on the shoulders of many and we say thank you, Lord for what you have done. Hallelujah. It took this to propel us into a new phase of this great church. And we embrace this opportunity gladly. Hallelujah. God is a good God. And he is worthy of his praise. Amen. Tonight, anyone could be standing here and delivering this message, but I'm humble and honored that my dear overseer has given me this assignment tonight, and I will do my best. I know that it is in the wee hours of the morning in the United Kingdom, 1.30 in the morning there, but um, thank you for hanging in with us. We love you tonight. What a profound word the Lord has sent to this great organization in such a time as this. Call to inherit a blessing. Call to inherit a blessing. It is to be found in our scriptures tonight, First Peter chapter 3, and the specific verses are 8 and 9. But tonight, I also want to go beyond 8 and 9 and read 10, 11, and 12. And the word of God says in the first Peter chapter three, 
verses 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful and courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that you are there unto call that you should inherit a blessing. Verse 10, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good and let him seek peace and ensue it. Hallelujah. Peter has called Christians to pilgrim in this world. He made it clear that we will live differently in this world and not like everyone else. And as Peter continues to edify the body of Christ, he gives us from chapters 1 through 3 various examples and different um, experiences and expectations for individuals who are saved. He teaches the citizens, the servants, the wives, the husbands. And he gives us all different examples as to what the expectations are and how we should live as believers. And then we enter into the third chapter. Peter now brings the church universal to the forefront. He challenges us to live godly when we find ourselves afflicted by non-Christians in the world. Make no mistake, the body of Christ is under attack the body of Christ is experiencing things we have never experienced before. It was also, if we remember, Peter who had a spiritual conversation with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Where Jesus asked his disciples, whom do you say that I am. Some called him a prophet and some likened him to others. But Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And it was in that moment that Jesus uh, affirmed to Peter that flesh and blood could not reveal who he was. But that revelation comes directly from God himself. And Jesus said, and it is upon that revelation that you know who I am. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The enemy has always tried to destroy God's house and God's people. But it seems as if the more, just like in the Old Testament, they oppress the body of Christ, the more they multiplied, the stronger they became and the church advanced. In the New Testament, during the great persecution, the Bible says, 
as they scattered them throughout the book of Acts. They planted the church here, there, and everywhere. And as a result, we are here tonight still standing in spite of great trials and great tribulation. The church triumphant is alive and well. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Peter's exhortations in the third chapter switches to the final group that he will address. It is the church. Verse 8 starts off, finally, all of you, finally, every one of you, take a look at who you are, who we ought to be. We can divide uh, these up into two groups, verse 8 and 9. And the first category of exhortations you will find in the 8th verse. Here are five adjectives that describe the identity of God's people. The second group you will find in verse 9. Through his generally echoed in remaining these verses as to who we ought to be when we come up against evil individuals. Never, the Bible says, return evil for evil, but always return blessings when we come up against evil. I want to read verse 8 from the New American Standard Bible. It is a very literal translation, and it says for verse 8, and I quote, to sum up, let all be harmonious. Let all be sympathetic. Let all be brotherly. Let all be kind-hearted and humble in spirit. What I like about the NASB here is that it captures how the original uses adjectives in a substantive way. Many translations you will find turn this into something about having these qualities among us. But this particular translation turns this text to remind us these are uh, qualities that we must have within us. We must have unity. We must have compassion. Be harmonious. Be compassionate. And as Peter turns to address all Christians as a whole, he talks about their identity. An identity that will call them to certain actions. But the actions are to flow from who we are. They are to be identified as a compassionate people a humble people, and a united people. In essence, Peter was saying, the only thing that should identify the church is our unity, our compassion, our humility, and our love one for the other. Not how much we speak in tongues, not the size of our congregations, not how well-versed or prolific we are in speaking the word, 
But there are some characteristics that the body of Christ must possess. Compassion. Humility. Unity. And love one for the other. All these descriptions are especially inward looking. When we look at verse 8. Inward looking not just as an individual. But inward looking as a church community. You will see later that the last several verses that I've been talking about is in contrast to the world. The world treats you horribly. But in return, we are to treat the world with love. Verse 9 now turns to that theme. But here in verse 9, Peter pauses as he addresses all of us to remind us that we are not to function just as individuals, but we are to function collectively as a body, as a church, as one Christian community. We are to be, the Bible says, of one mind. They are to be sympathetic to each other. We are to love each other as brothers. We are to be humble towards each other. If the world around them is going to hate us, or the world around us is going to hate us, it is important that when they come into our presence, we return their hate with love. Hallelujah. We return their hate with love. They must be able, the world, to find the love of God deep within our hearts. And that is the most powerful revelation in this text. That although the world may treat us horribly, and although the world will be merciless towards us, when we come together as a church, we find refuge. We find refuge. Because in our church community, there is love. There is compassion. There is humility. There is empathy one for the other. Because we have inherited a blessing from Almighty God. This theme, if you've been following over the last several years in our organization, the Lord has laid it upon the heart of our overseer to gather the church back into humility, to bring us into unity, one with the other. This convention is no different that although we are not gathered in the same place, God is still calling us to come together in one mind, one spirit, and we are to love one another like Christ loved his church. Glory, hallelujah. When we are with the world, we feel very different. We feel like outsiders. But when we come together as a church, we can be united. We can be loved as family. We can be treated 
as God desires us to be. The problem with Peter's expectation is that it is not always visible. It is not always felt. Because oftentimes when we come together, we do find the struggle. We find the difficulty. Because in some churches, not this one. It often feels like the world where there is no compassion. There is no unity. There is no one mindness. What the church fights against is to ensure that the devil who we fight every day does not infiltrate the church of the living God. And then we begin to look like the world, treat each other like the world, and then people begin to leave church because they cannot find refuge. God is calling us in this convention to take an individual look at who we are that we can be collectively impactful to a world that is dying. Let the church be the church. And let the people rejoice because God is looking for a healthy church. He's looking for a stable church. And anybody that walked through our doors must recognize that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We have a different sound. We have a different look. We have a different interaction. Hey, hallelujah. For the church is a place of refuge. What the enemy would prefer is that we create cliques, we create groups, we create organizations in organizations and divide the body of Christ. But we are not divided. All one body we, one in hope, one in doctrine, and one in charity. Somebody say amen here. We are not divided. All one body we. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are one. And one in the spirit. The same when we begin to move into verse 9. The exhortation Peter calls us not to return evil for evil. Or rivaling with rivaling. And for those that do not know what rivaling is, rivaling is insult for insult. Don't insult someone back. When they insult you in return. Rivaling can also be translated as verbal abuse. Don't verbally abuse someone just because they verbally abuse you. Peter says we are to bless in return. This is the Christian payback. This is how Christians get even. We don't conspire to hurt or to harm one another. But when we get insulted, we give back blessings. When people give us evil, we return the favor by giving them good. As Christ said, we are to love our enemies. And enemies are not just those in the world. 
But even your enemies that may exist in the church, love your enemies. It is kind of ambiguous how Peter makes his transition in the text. It is almost as if he wants the church or the Christian community to come up to a higher level in the spirit. Because at this particular time, the church was being abused verbally and physically. They were experiencing severe persecution and demise. But the writer says, I want to encourage you that in spite of what you're going through, heaven is better than this. And I want to encourage somebody tonight, heaven is better than this. And I want to get finished quickly, but I want to make sure that I lay the foundation for the next several days. That we do not just have hope in this life. For if our hope was in this life alone, we would be men most miserable. But oh, we have a home. And heaven is better than this. Hallelujah. And we are just strangers here. Passing through. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. If heaven's not my home. Then Lord what uh, would I do? I praise God tonight. Uh, because my home is eternal. Oh Shakuriana. God is sifting his church in such a time as this. Hallelujah. 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 Consider we are not to be vindictive. We can trust God's justice we can allow God to take care of our enemies. We can trust God to fight on our behalf. We can trust God to move in our favor. That those that rise up against us, God will handle on our behalf. That's what God expects. expects. We have experienced, every one of us as believers, God's own goodness. And even though we didn't deserve it, Christians are called to express God's goodness in return. You cannot have the love of God inside of you and not have the love of God to give to someone else. Hallelujah. Here he tells us in the scripture, this is why you must love one another. This is why we must embrace one another. He says that we might inherit a blessing. Well, that is a very significant thing. It is pretty important thing as well for all of us to consider. He says that blessing people who treat us evil is in some way connected with us inheriting a blessing. That is, I believe, a comment worthy of dissecting some more. And Peter does that in verses 10 through 12. He flushes the word, the verse and says, for, F-O-R, for, he giving the rational for the purpose of the exhortation in verse 8 and 9. 
he says, he's explaining what he meant when he said how we have been called to bless that we might inherit a blessing. And that's what leads us to verses 10 and 12. For he that will love life and he that will see good days, let him refrain his tongue from speaking evil in order to experience good days, not just in heaven, but good days in this life. You've got to mind what you say. Mind how you say it. Woo. So giving blessings back when you receive evil is a spiritual formula to individually receive a miracle and a blessing. If you are going to experience good days, learn to give compassion. Learn to be humble. Learn to love one another. Some people are miserable because they give misery. Some people are hateful because they give hate. Some people lack plenty because they give nothing. But if you bless them that curse you, God will bless you. You will access your inheritance. You will access the blessing that God has in store for you. Jesus. In order, and I'm almost done. Lord, help me. In my preparation, I could not miss how Peter, in his epistle, transitions us to Psalm 34. He actually makes this rationale that he gives with almost an exact quote in verses 10 to 12. He's actually almost quoting Psalm 34, 12 through 16. He says for, in verses 10 to 12, 1 Peter, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let me make that very clear. This particular verse, these verses carries on the sense of verse 9, they are closely connected. If you want to find blessings in this life, speak good with your tongue. If you want to experience blessings not in heaven, I'm talking about in New York. I'm talking about in California. I'm talking about Jamaica and the United Kingdom. If you want to experience good in this life, allow your tongue to be sweetened with the Holy Spirit. Speak good of your brother. Speak good of your sister. Don't kill one another with your tongue. But let us love one another. Lokoshata. The church must be a safe place. We must be able to protect one another. God, one another. You are my brother. I, you are my sister. 
We are one body. I love you. I speak good of you. Not because of any other reason, but because I want my days on this earth to be longer and to be filled with goodness. For surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord use your tongue to encourage one another use your tongue to lift up one another use your tongue to build up the kingdom use your tongue to sweeten the atmosphere use your tongue to bless those that curse you use your tongue to encourage those who are down yeah. Lord have mercy Hi. almost done Lord help me Woo. I know you can't touch nobody I know you can't touch nobody but wherever you are touch yourself and say Lord bridle my tongue let me speak good of those that speak evil of me let me give somebody love that I know don't love me help me to love my enemies help me to treat them right when Jesus was on the cross there were two thieves by his side one said since you are God get down and save yourself but just after they crucify him, I hear the Lord saying, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Within that split second, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have destroyed the world. He could have changed the situation. But he used his tongue and said, Lord, forgive them. I think it was Stephen who was being stoned to death. And the Bible says as the stones hit him, the heavens open. And the Lord said, the Bible said, Stephen said, Lord, forgive them. You've got to learn how to access your inheritance. The only way to access your inheritance is to bless somebody else. There is a distinct difference in First Peter three nine in getting a blessing and giving a blessing. Don't return evil for evil, or don't return insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose. For you were called for the very purpose. Your calling is more than preaching. Your calling is more than your position. Your calling is more than your assignment. Your calling has to be more than your title. Your calling is to bless somebody. Your calling is to lift up somebody. If you cannot love me, I question your calling. Your calling can't just to be, can't just be to be anointed. 
and see someone suffering. Your calling can't just be you can preach. Your calling can't just be you can teach. That cannot be the extent of your calling. Your calling must be grounded in your love one for another. Please note, be very careful how we treat one another. We must be characterized by grace rather than by grudge toward those who have wronged us. There will be times in the body of Christ when individuals will hurt you. They will betray you. They will criticize you. Try to destroy your character. And although you have the ability and the, the means to hurt and to fight back, Paul ch Peter challenges us to take a closer look at your inheritance. Our future destiny determines our present conduct. When individuals do not know their inheritance, their present conduct is disorderly. Hey, when we are not fully aware of what God has promised us, we react in the moment with no thought, no carefulness. But when we know what God has promised us, we learn to have the spirit of discernment to know when the enemy is attacking not your just today, but the enemy is attacking your destiny. Lord have mercy. When your tongue is undisciplined, you will limit your spiritual ability to grow and to and strive. You will allow your ministry to become dormant because you have not allowed yourself to encounter or experience the heritage or the inheritance of that God has given us. My God help me here tonight. From the very beginning. God's covenant with Abraham. Spelt out a twofold dimension of blessing. Verse 2 of the 12th chapter of Genesis. The Bible says. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And make your name great. And so shall you receive a blessing? No. That's not what the text says. The text says. And I will make your name great. So you shall be a blessing. Lord have mercy. The inheritance is not for your own selfish desires. It's not for your own elevation. It's not for your own uplifting. It's not for your pride. It's not for your arrogance. We are blessed to be a blessing. Lord, have mercy. I feel a preach in the room. We are not blessed to be blessed uh, just to sit on our inheritance uh, but the Lord bless you uh, that you might be a blessing uh, to somebody else uh, I beg this convention uh, will not just be about who was the greatest preacher it will not be about what praise group was the best uh, but every one of us uh, will seek to bless somebody uh, Bless those that hurt you. Bless those that curse you. It takes.
takes a special anointing. And I'm closing my book to receive this blessing. Because everybody can't be a blessing. Because you have to be blessed to be a blessing. You have to be blessed to bless somebody else. I need you to be a blessed person before you bless somebody else. Because oh, once you're blessed, you can a circle time. Once you're blessed, you will bless somebody else. You can't see your brother struggling and not lift them up. Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. Aye, 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 aye. I can love somebody because God loves me. I can bless somebody because God has blessed me. I can lift up somebody because God has lifted me up. He took me out of the miry clay. He planted my feet on a rock to stay. Listen, listen to the psalmist. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast of the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. But the whole purpose of the text was, was showing when David had to disguise himself as a madman to save his life. The Bible says after he had been delivered and after Nabal and her husband, uh, Abigail and Nabal, recognized that David was a blessed man. Yes. Abigail knew that David had purpose. Her husband said he was just another man. Oh, God. And thought he was nothing but just another man. But Abigail saw the anointing and the destiny on the life of David, he was to be king. Oh, but David was young, inexperienced, impulsive. Oh, yes, he was. But God put Abigail in his life for a reason to teach him how to not be too impulsive. Because if he acts in the moment, he might ruin his destiny. You're not hearing me. <laughs> Let God fight your battles. God will send the right person in your life to help refine you. For the anointing is good. The anointing is necessary. But somebody has to help groom you. That you do not forfeit what God has placed on your life. Oh God help me. Too many people have preached a good message. But they've rejected counseling. They have preached a good sermon. But they've turned their back on encouragement. And they have derailed what God has placed in their lives. But thank God for Abigail who said to David cultivate that anointing. You can't kill no because you are destined for the kingdom. And when the test came David was in the cave. He came this close to Saul. But because somebody told him, don't render evil for evil. 
God will fight for you. Hallelujah. He said, I will touch not the Lord's servant and do his prophet no harm. Some of you had the opportunity to defeat your enemies, to embarrass them too, like they embarrassed you. But you recognize you were destined for something greater. If you have an inheritance tonight, I want you for the next 30 seconds to praise God. Let me tell you why you're praising him. You're praising him because you could have won, but you took second seat. Let me tell you why you're praising him. You could have killed them, but God sat on you. You could have destroyed your enemies, but God held you down. I said praise him because you didn't lose your mind. God gave you the victory. God gave you the victory. Say yes, say yes. I come to encourage somebody. I come to encourage you, the one that's sitting there with your head down because you've been discouraged. God knows you didn't have to take it. God knows you could be doing so much better. God knows you could have gone much further. Thank God you recognize you have an inheritance. Listen, the more, get this in your spirit, the more they crush you, the more blessed you are. The more they despise you, the greater the blessing, the hotter the battle, the sweeter the victory. The next time a trial comes your way, next time persecution come your way, lift up your hand and say, Lord, thank you for another blessing I've just inherited thank you for another blessing you have just placed inside of me if that's you tonight throw your head back open your mouth and shout I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel in my belly. I feel like convention. I feel like convention in the room. Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. Yes in Jamaica. Yes, in England. Yes, in California. Yes, in New York. Say. We are praising God because the church has passed through a whole lot. The enemy thought he would destroy this mission. The enemy thought he would silence this church. Lord have mercy. The enemy thought the doors would be locked and the doors would be closed. But God, we thank you. Through many dangers, toils and snares, not me, 
But the church, we have already come to his grace that brought us safe thus far. And grace will lead us on. Put your hands together and praise him. You have to allow God to work a work in you. You have to allow God to allow his purpose to be done in you. The inheritance implies that there is someone who is keeping what you are to receive. The inheritance has a caretaker. The caretaker of your inheritance is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. You cannot access what God has for you unless you go through the process God desires for you to have what he has in store for you. So every struggle, every difficulty, hardship every setback is uniquely designed for God to move you into your inheritance so if you are called for an inheritance then you're also called for a struggle you're also called for a trial. You're also called for persecution. If you are called for a blessing, you're called for disappointment. You're called for a setback. Oh. So, let God do a new thing in you tonight. Whatever. Whatever. You ask for whatever you prayed for. It won't be denied. Listen, somebody is going through a struggle right now. I don't care where you are. Lift up your hands and let God fix it for you. You don't cut no revenge, no revenge, no conspiracy to say, Lord, have your way, have your way, have your way. Let Him work it on your behalf, let Him do it for you. Hey, whatever oh. whatever you prayed for you prayed for it won't be denied Said the Lord. Last time, and we're going to pray. Everybody, come on, say, God, I will do a new thing. Come on, say, do it in me, God. Hey. Change my heart. Change my mind. Change my attitude. Do a new thing in me, God. Whatever, whatever. Whatever. 
tonight but you will give them the resilience the tenacity the appetite and the desire to hold on don't allow God the enemy to draw us out of your presence we give you God every enemy we give you every ridicule every abuse every persecution and we know God you will fight for us I pray that you will give us courage to stand because we know God that our inheritance is in this life yes and we declare good days hallelujah good days for your people but it does not stop here we know that you will have laid up for us a reward in heaven that moth can do no harm it is a building whose maker and builder is God have your way and we will be careful to give you the glory we give you glory we give you glory we give you glory I will do 